welcome to another episode of Coffee with Developers. Today with Rob Kandel, he is Jamstack developer at Arc Labs, his own company, the host of the Front End podcast, and based in Yorkshire, UK. How are you doing, Rob? Hello. Yeah, very good, mate. Very good. Thank you for having me on board. Always, uh, always got, always happy to make time to chat about development. So. Um... Tell us a little bit, uh, today we are going to talk a little bit about um, how tech changed throughout the years, but maybe let's take a, a look first at your journey. Can I, you tell us with what you started and a little bit with what tech you started and a little bit going, uh, walking us through your journey? Yeah, I, I have one of those really vanilla origin stories um, where, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of people who had really crazy backgrounds. Like, oh, I used to be a lion, lion tamer or I used to breed otters or something. And then they got into JavaScript and that was it. They, they kind of changed. I was always really good with computers and I kind of took them apart and built them. And then I started doing less of that and more development. But when I started, it was um, back in the in the heady days of ASP.NET 2.0 with, with a bit of Visual Basic. And then I kind of moved into into C Sharp, that's, that's really what everyone was using in kind of private commercial environments. So I, I ditched the, the Visual Basic and learned uh, and, and sort of switched to, uh, to C Sharp. But that was back, back in the old um, ASP.NET 2.0 days. It was slightly less um, clunky than the old AS, the original ASP, where it was kind of dotted and peppered about inside of uh, HTML. Uh, and we used web forms and things. It was still fairly clunky, but we did really exciting things with it. Uh, and, and then I kind of, over my career, gradually did a bit less back-end full stacky things and moved more into the UX UI side of things where it was all modern front-end things and, and that's where I find myself now. So it's very much heavily nestled in the Jamstack with TypeScript and React and Next.js and Gatsby and, and occasionally playing with things like Shopify. So it's uh, it's been quite a journey. But yeah, I, I really like the, the front-end where I've ended up. All right. Uh, so you're, you started with web tech around when? Uh, oh God, it feels like... You always feel so old when you talk about anything to do with technology. Because I mean, I'm I'm only forty. I'm I'm almost forty one, um, <clears throat> which sounds really old to some people. But uh, the the technology moves so quickly. I started with that. Oh God, about twenty ish years ago. So it's, I've I've been kind of doing development in, in the IT tech arena for about twenty years ish. How was it back then developing websites? So it was. Like today you have all this front end tooling and everything else. And I've also been there, but how was it for you back then just building a website? Uh, it painful. It was, uh, I mean, I, I loved it. I think that's, there's something weirdly said masochistic about developers. We kind of, we love the challenge of fighting with the computer. Um, but yeah, it, it was quite a steep learning curve. I mean, I, I didn't really, and I did bits of CSS, but I didn't really know what it was. This was back in the day when MySpace was a thing and you could kind of edit uh, your profile using what what turned out to be CSS, but at the time you were just like background red. You know, <laughs> I know I know how that worked. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it was quite a steep learning curve. It was very clunky and it was very inefficient. I mean, certainly the old web forms approach with .NET, you know, it, it, it worked on like post back. So it basically anything you did on the front end, it post the whole page back to the server. It got an, as this weird form object and it sort of sifted through that for you. And then you could do stuff with that data and then kind of do something and pass it back. And yeah, it, it wasn't hugely efficient. It wasn't nice and slick. Uh, we didn't quite have this concept of like microservices or micro front ends or, or any of this kind of thing. Um, so it was a little bit more clunky. Laying things out was incredibly difficult because all we had was kind of floats and they didn't work. That we, we I came into it just after the kind of lay everything out with a table, which must have been absolutely horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, and, but oh, it was yeah. all kind of, yeah, it was all float based layouts, which um, if you've never used float-based lay float layouts, it is uh, it is a challenge. Not as hard as tables, but definitely a challenge. Yeah, I remember developing with tables still, like for like personal things, just trying stuff out. But still, it was the, the table, and then the sidebar, the typical sidebar, was one part of the table, and then the main part, and then just the top. Oh my god, that was not responsible whatsoever. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It wasn't fun. And if you want a flavor of what that's like back then, just go and edit an email template because they've still hung on to the cutting edge of table-based layouts. I don't, I don't, I don't think email, um, email HTML's come on much since in many years. So that's what it was like. But entire websites uh, with tables. So yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, you know, hats off to anyone who went through that. <clears throat> it was uh, yeah a difficult road. 
And there was a lot. There was a lot more things like uh, different. I know they're deprecated now, but things like the marquee and the flash. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So if you want to do any like little scrolling effects, now you do it with some kind of translate animation with CSS because it's just so powerful. Uh, but then you actually had a HTML tag that was bunged in, and it kind of like scrolled stuff across the screen for you. <laughs> those, yeah. Those were the do you remember FTP to server deployments? I certainly remember, and it was painful. Yeah, well, again, we're, we're spoiled these days with these lovely and, you know, arguably sometimes quite complex uh, CID, C, CICD pipelines and build processes and things. Yeah, we, we had uh, an, an FTP folder on a server somewhere that you just kind of stuffed uh, things or with FileZilla. You used to use FileZilla. A bit more yeah, yeah, cy yeah. Cyberduck, I'm a Cyberduck fan now, but... Um, and I think Panic make a really good one uh, called Transit or something like that. But anyway, yeah, it was all like FileZilla. In the past six years, maybe, I did work for a large university and they still did part of their site with FTP transfers. Um, and that, that site gets millions of visits uh, a, a month. That was that was interesting. When I started there as like a lead front end dev, it was like, oh, yeah, we just we build all the things and then we just FTP them manually. Someone physically did it. And it was like, wow, that seems that seems like a really... Uh, dangerous way to live but you know I mean whatever wherever you get your thrills right so you lived a little bit through um, a significant span of uh, different tech and uh, what would you say is something that you don't miss about coding website back in the day uh, yeah I think it's just the the manual effort involved um, i think certainly when we talked about like deployments and things i think nowadays we have very robust and reliable build pipelines where you can inject things like testing you know that that unit testing wasn't quite as much of a thing uh back then but we can test things we can lint files we can make sure um we're happy with like coding standards you know we've got a lot of things a lot of these menial tasks done for us that we would normally have to manually do, which is fine if you get used to it. But, you know, you'd end up in these situations where one or two people in the company would be like the the, the silos for this information or these processes. And if they left, you had a problem. If they got it wrong, you know, the, the nice thing about automating these kind of um, repeatable processes is that the robots do it so much better than we can and they make sure things are done in the right order and the same way every single time unless we change the input parameters or the output parameters or whatever it is so i think that's something that i both love now and that i don't miss from the old days just the kind of the amount of manual intervention that there was just because i think that introduced uh it's only opened the doors for a lot more errors and a lot more problems yeah, so the front-end tooling, basically, it's um, a double-edged sword, in my opinion, a little bit, because it does so many things. At the same time, it makes things difficult for beginners, uh, because you come in and you have uh, Vite, you have Webpack, if that's some something that still exists, and you have so many different toolings, uh, and you don't even know where to start, and it's hard for a beginner to really find out what it does. Once you do, it's great because it takes a lot off your plate. But what do you, what do you think about when someone gets into tech today uh, about how difficult it is compared to uh, 20 years ago? Yeah, it's um, it's a strange one because it, it's it's like the same level of difficulty, but in, in a different way. Uh, when I started, there wasn't quite the resources like YouTube and Udemy and um, even just being able to connect, like with with you in the in the Netherlands, you know, uh, you know, even in the Netherlands, yeah, and um, connect connect with you. Not a thing. I I did a lot of my learning with books that were like this big, like typing code out from the book, and occasionally they had a CD ROM with two very peppy Americans on it. So I'm going, yeah, let's learn the code, and you're like, oh yeah, let's do it. And that was great. Uh, it was a lot more challenging doing that doing it that way, but um, it sort of streamlined it. I think the difficulty people have now is that. There's never been a better set of resources out there, and for free as well. With you know, free code camp and the Odin project, you can get started literally for nothing, um, just you know, own investment in your own time. But it is, it's knowing what to learn, and there's so many things vying for your attention. Yeah. Which one, how do you know which ones are good? And like you said, back in the day, it was HTML, occasionally a bit of CSS, and just JavaScript dumped into the HTML file or linked, you know, from a separate JavaScript file, and you can still build websites like that absolutely you can however 
um, modern day front end development, you, like you said, you've got the CID, CD processes, you've got uh, these building and transpiling and you know Webpack and all those kind of bundlers. Um, you've then got these frameworks on top of it like React that ultimately people kind of have to learn if they want to get into that environment as a job. Um, and it is, it's where do you start? Uh, but I mean, my advice with that is normally start simple with those foundational building blocks. So your CSS, HTML and, and JavaScript and build something with that and then layer stuff in. You know, you don't need to know about Webpack and Vite and these other things right out of the gates. You will do eventually, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of just, you know, go and buy everything all at once. Just, just go and learn the stuff that you need uh, initially and then build on it. Yeah, but the time you get there, it might be another tool you need, right? And <laughs> um, that, yeah, the uh, the uh, the, the latest. I mean, yeah, v, V's amazing, but that is like the newer one on the block. And yeah. now everyone's talking about Astro, which is not like V at all, but it's something you know, another thing that's like, oh, what's this? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it is that that's the challenge these days. Is that it's not so much the availability as just the volume, and it's how you filter that noise out. I think. Yeah, especially because on social media and also forums and everything, everyone has a different opinion and everyone will tell you something else. Like people will tell you, no, no, React, learn React is the best, learn Vue is the best, you learn Swell is the best. And then it's like, okay, so I have to learn everything. So I think this is still one of the bigger challenges of people getting into tech uh, nowadays. And I think that that is another challenge is trying to filter out the opinions. You know, as an experienced person, I, I still have stuff to learn. I still learn stuff every day. Yeah. Um, I'm connected, connected with loads of people like yourself, and I, I love to learn things. But opinions are just that. You know, I think if someone told you, oh, you absolutely should learn Knockout JS, that is quite an old JavaScript library, and I'm sure there are people who use it. But that, I probably wouldn't bother with that because that is very outdated and it's not supported or maintained, I don't believe, anymore. So that's arguably a waste of time. But getting into the weeds about is react better or angular it's all really about what empowers you to be the most productive i don't like angular i, ju I just don't but i don't have any real great reasons for it i find it a bit complex and clunky i just don't gel with it but i'd never sit there and go oh don't learn angular it's terrible it's a great framework just not for me so i think it's it's filtering those opinions and, and maybe taking them with a pinch of salt that they are just people's opinions they're not there isn't really a right or wrong answer i love react but i'd never say to someone learn that it's the best it's the most popular, arguably, yeah. but it doesn't make it the best. Yeah, I always think it comes down a lot to um, personal preference, really. Yeah. And sometimes you don't have a choice. You know, if, if you work with a company that you really like and they happen to use Vue, you're going to use Vue. You know, you can't just sort of come along and go, oh, I know React, yeah. can I use that? Well, no, because we use this other thing. So <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to keep an open mind with it. So are there things that um, you wish you could unlearn, maybe some bad habits you dragged on for years that nowadays you still somehow maybe thought patterns or think a ways of doing things that you wish you wouldn't have? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think one of the things I wish I was better at is, is leveraging like shortcuts within um, your editor. Like I use VS Code a lot, but I also have started moving to WebStorm by JetBrains. You know, that's a preference thing. It's not better or worse than uh, VS Code or anything else. It's just a different IDE. Um, and yeah, I know that VS Code's a text editor, not technically an IDE, just before anyone gets a bit excited about that. You can you can do some really powerful things with uh, with keyboard shortcuts and, and stuff like that. And I, I kind of, I, I do a lot of stuff more manually. I wish I, I, I was better at, um, you know, I think that's just because of the, when I, got into it in the day, there was a lot more kind of manual typing out of things. We didn't have things like Emmet, um, where I could just, you know, put abbreviations in and it knocked out a lot of HTML. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I wish I was better at um, being a bit more efficient and learning a bit more of my IDE shortcuts. That would probably be help me, help me a lot. I say this, like I can't go and learn it now. I just, yeah, that, that's, that's something I wish I was better at. All right. And um, what advice would you give someone that's entering into tech or especially to web development nowadays, uh, some advice you would give them to get started? Yeah, so I think what I, I, I do do this, I do give this advice out a lot regularly because I do a lot of mentoring with people coming through getting into tech. Um, and I think once you've decided where your interests lie, for me, it's very much that user interface, the, the front end thing, if that's what you want to kind of pursue, um, I think, 
slow down and start with those building blocks. So your HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And I, I genuinely recommend something like the Odin Project or Free Code Camp or any one of those really big um, popular ones that because I mean, A, they're free, um, which which is really helpful when you're getting into it. And they're very proven and, and you know, mature solutions. And I think what's what's better about them is that they offer some kind of curriculum. So it's like we start here and then we build on it and then we do another thing. Um, rather than scattergunning about 10 or 12 Udemy courses that you have no idea if they're any good mm -hmm. or not. Um, there's going to yeah. be a lot of overlap with them. You might start them and not finish them. Um, I think, you know, go for a nice linear um, progression-based curriculum like they teach you in soft school if you want to do it and build on those skills and then slowly, but start narrow and then slowly broaden it out. Don't try and learn everything at once because it's, it's just yeah. too much information. And you will, the downside with it is some people will do it but most people will just get put off to it because now oh, I've got to learn Git and then, you know, the command line and then something else. And it's just too much and your brain will just shut down and then you'll get disheartened and stop learning. Yeah, that's great advice, Rob. So now we talked a lot about tech, but um, what do you do when you're not coding? Do you have some interesting hobbies you can share with us? Uh, yeah, primarily music. I, I write a lot of uh, music, and not in a kind of like, oh, here's somewhere you can go and listen to it. It's, it's largely for my own benefit. But I, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a cover, local covers band in Yorkshire. I, I play a lot of, um, yeah, I, I play a lot of music, uh, guitar mainly. I started when I was about 13. And I find is for all it's very technical, it can be quite a creative outlet, but it's not. Um, it's still very technical from a mindset point of view, and I, I like the creativity that playing music on a guitar brings me because it just allows your brain to kind of switch off and just focus on the music so I, I, it sounds like awfully cliche and a bit sort of fuzzy but I, I really like it so yeah primarily you'll find me going and playing guitar or i've got a keyboard in my hand one of those two things oh well, that's marvelous uh, rob so i think we uh, reached the end uh, of this i want to thank you very much for uh, for joining rob and also everyone that's watching this video and listening to it um, as a podcast. Also, thank you for tuning in. And uh, Rob, I wish you a very pleasant rest of your day and I hope to see you around. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you again. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>